preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, I'm Jennifer Junta Hausler, Lecture Administrator for the Charles Simon Center for Adult Life and Learning. It's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for our annual Newman Lecture. This lecture was endowed by Nikki Newman Tanner in memory of her father, Albert Hardy Newman. And we wish to thank her and Mr. Tanner for their generous support of this evening. Our speaker tonight is Gary Wills, one of the country's greatest historians. He's written over 20 books, including John Wayne's America and the national bestseller, Lincoln at Gettysburg, which was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. He's also received the National Book Critics Award twice, and even a Peabody Award for Excellence in Broadcasting for writing and narrating a frontline documentary called The Candidates. His articles also appear frequently in the New York Review of Books. He's currently an adjunct professor of history at Northwestern University and has also taught at Johns Hopkins, Union College, McAllister College, Michigan Law School, Notre Dame, the University of California, Yale, and Princeton. His new book, A Necessary Evil, examines anti-government attitudes throughout history. After the lecture, there will be a selling and signing of the new book in the adjacent hall. Please welcome Gary Wills. Thank you very much. Americans puzzle themselves and others with some of the mysteries of our politics. I just came back from Italy recently and they, they really can't figure us out at all. <laughs> Take just five from many examples. First, why do we love guns so much that we tolerate far the highest murder rate of any industrialized nation? Number two, why do we, the richest nation in the world, lack what most other industrialized countries are able to afford, a comprehensive health plan for our citizens? Three, why can we not, like other nations, limit the flow of money into our bloated and endless political campaigns? Four, why do we, whom world order would most benefit, refuse to cooperate with the agencies most likely to implement that order, refusing to ratify the Law of the Seas Treaty, the Landmine Treaty, the Nuclear Testing Treaty, the World Court Protocols? Five, why do we undercut the UN, refusing to pay our dues to it, agitating against any military service under its commanders? Well, to give very quick answers to those five questions. One, if we surrender our guns, the government will deprive us of every freedom we possess. Two, a comprehensive health plan would be socialized medicine, depriving doctors and patients of basic freedoms. Three, if we let government tell us how to donate to candidates, we are depriving ourselves of the right of free expression and the First Amendment is a sham. Four, if we let other nations have authority over us, what will be even, uh, that would be even worse than delegating authority to our own government. We would be oppressed then by world government or a new world order. Five, the UN too is a danger to our liberty, best kept weak as we try to keep our own government. In short, all these anomalies occur because we respond to a fear of government that is deeply ingrained in our history. The Cold War fear, you remember, was the communists are coming, the communists are coming. A much longer standing fear can now reassert itself that the government is coming, the government is coming. This fear goes beyond the healthy suspicion of authority that all peoples entertain and should entertain. That kind of reserve felt in other countries does not keep them from limiting the quantity and kinds of firearms set adrift throughout their communities or prevent them from caring for the health needs of the poor 
or from joining mutually beneficial international pacts. Many free nations control the length of their political campaigns and the terms of their conduct, often in quite severe detail. Why are we not able to? Well, <clears throat> other nations have not nurtured a myth that the government should be so distrusted as to be self-defeating, that it should be deliberately inefficient, that it should have various self-checking devices that can easily bring it to a halt. They do not have presidents who repeat, as our President Reagan did on many occasions, that no matter what the need, government is not the solution but the problem. They do, not have, they do not have a flourishing body of legal scholars telling us that the Constitution itself provides for the overthrow of the Constitution. Their terrorists are not able, as ours are, to quote Jefferson as saying that even a bad rebellion against government is better than no rebellion. No matter how bad the rebellion, government is worse. This attitude is so commonplace that we rarely notice how odd it is that building a politics on opposition to government is like basing marriage on a hatred of sex, or a doctor's life on hatred of medicine, or a dramatic career on hatred of the theater. Admittedly, government can become oppressive. So can marriage. It can become a thing of illusion, like the theater. It can even kill you, like medicine. But when a spouse dominates a spouse, we blame that on the breakdown of a marriage, not on marriage itself. When a doctor kills, we call that an abuse of medicine, not the essence of medicine. But when government is oppressive by intent or in effect, we call that just government being government. It is by its very nature oppressive. That is why we want even the government to be anti-governmental. Several Supreme Court decisions have been based on the doctrine that our government was intended to be inefficient. Efficient government, after all, can oppress. Better that ours should fail than it should succeed at repressing people. That is why we have a government that can check and balance itself to a standstill or to gridlock, one that would rather dither than do wrong, one that rejoices in its own fecklessness. It is as if when we go to buy a car, we insist that the seller put it in writing that the thing is guaranteed to break down. Better that it work feebly than that it work well enough to run people over. The problem, of course, is that people who might need government, the poor, the sick, the disadvantaged, are sometimes told, we would like to help you, we would like to be compassionate conservatives, but we do not want to enslave you in the process. It is better that you be poor and sick and hungry than that you be, be oppressed by the government. Now, how can we believe that a government could be framed deliberately to break down? Anyone who looks at the Constitution will find that hard to justify. What are the opening words? We the people, in order to form a more perfect union. What does a perfect union mean? Something that's just dream -boaty? Something that's terrific? It was a political term of art, borrowed from classical theory about the perfect constitution, what Aristotle called the teleia constitution, <clears throat> and used also in Greek medicine. Ancient Greek gynecologists like Sorenus called a baby perfect for the same reason that we do to indicate that it has all its parts, no ear or toe missing. In the same way, Aristotle said that the perfect, that is the completed government, has all the parts it needs to perform its tasks. The Articles of Confederation, which the Constitution replaced, did not form a perfect government. That is why they said they had to set up a more perfect government. It lacked its necessary parts. It had no executive. The drafters of the articles believed that only representatives of the separate locales could be controlled by devices like instruction and recall and short terms and open sessions. An executive for the whole government 
not tied to one locale and could to be called back there, would not be similarly dependent minute by minute on the constituents, so the Articles refused to have any executive in the government. The result was disastrous. The Continental Congress had to run a revolution, supply armies, manage currency, carry on diplomacy, conduct Indian affairs, and occasionally make law. Jefferson complained that as a result, quote, the smallest trifle of that administrative kind occupies as long as the most important act of legislation and takes the place of everything else, close quote. He said that what was needed was, quote, a federal government which could walk on its own legs without leaning for su support on the state legislatures. A separate executive, that is, had to be created for efficiency's sake, not to make the government inefficient. The powers under the Articles were insufficient, said Jefferson, until, quote, a new compact shall make them more perfect, close quote. What else would be needed for a perfect government? A separate judiciary. The Articles didn't have that either. They required that disputes between the states be settled by Congress, which had to set up ad hoc arbitration boards case by case in a very cumbrous process. That prevented the formation of a standard regime and discipline and tradition of law. Again, a separate judiciary had to be created for efficiency's sake. And that's how we came with the three branches, not to check and balance each other, but to do their jobs separately by a division of labor. Even within a single branch, the separation was made on principles of different function. Madison said that the Senate differs from the House, not as in Europe, because different parts of society are being represented, the Lords in the House of Lords and the Commons in the House of Commons, but to perform different tasks. The Senate has longer terms, staggered terms, higher age requirements, so that it will serve as an institutional memory in the government to deal with other countries. So they will not think that they have made a treaty with a government that will go out of existence every two years. No, nobody will be in who was there who signed the treaty. That is why the Senate handles diplomacy, the making of treaties, the making of war, the confirmation of ambassadors. The House, by contrast, which handles money, is reelected more frequently and responds to domestic discontents. Our three branches of government, then, were not meant to check and balance each other to a standstill. Uh, we have been taught, nonetheless, that checks and balances are the essence of our government. You don't find that language said, used by the defenders of the Constitution when it was up for ratification. You find it in the enemies of the Constitution. Madison <clears throat> thought that the Articles had lots of checks, not only the ones that Patrick Henry praised, recall and instruction and that kind of thing, but the fact that the states could so easily uh, paralyze the government. He said that in any league, states that are all equal will will have a checking effect on each other and lead to stalemate. Patrick Henry agreed. He said, yes, that's exactly why we want the Articles, why we want to keep them. We don't want the Constitution because it does not have checks and balances. Uh, the Constitution lacked the real checks, he said, of recall and uh, e equality of the states. Well, even if there's not equality of the states under the Constitution, People say that there is equality of the branches. In fact, we even hear another wonderful word, that our three branches of government are co-equal, as if they could be equaler than equal. Uh, the trouble with that is that they're not equal and were never intended to be. As Madison put it in Federalist Number 51, in a, rep in a Republican government, the legislative authority necessarily predominates. How could it not? The making of law precedes in time and dignity the executing of it or the judicial application of it in the courts. 
The Congress makes law and holds the other branches accountable for carrying out that law. If the President is unfaithful in executing the law, Congress can remove him by impeachment and trial. It can remove other executive officers. It can remove Supreme Court judges. It can remove any federal judges. The courts and the President cannot reciprocally remove a single congressman, dissolve Congress, impeach Congress, investigate Congress. What power does the President have over the Congress? He can veto a bill, but only as a protest. If he says, in effect, I have difficulty executing this law, what he's really saying is, reconsider. Take my objections into account, and if you really want it, then pass it again, this time, of course, with a two-thirds majority, which makes sense because it's always difficult to deal with a grudging executor and you have to really want the law. But once the Congress does that, the whole matter is concluded. The President has no further recourse. He must execute the law, no matter what his own objections to it. The power of the Supreme Court in judicial review is precisely that, like that of the President's veto. The Court says to Congress, when it declares a law unconstitutional, wait a minute, the law you just passed goes against the fundamental law, the Constitution, the legislative act on which your own lawmaking power is based. Reconsider that law. Having done that, the court has fired its entire store of ammunition. There's nothing else it can do. But the Congress can re react along a whole range of options. It can rephrase the law to make it meet the constitutional objection. It can begin the amendment process so that the Constitution will include the law. It, if it feels that the court is perverting the Constitution, it can impeach one or more members of it. It can expand the membership of the court to get a fair hearing for its new law, since the very makeup and numbers of the court are always the creation of the Congress. So where is there any equality between these branches? Congress, in theory and in law, always gets the last word. Well, say some champions of weak government, if the checks are not in the branches of the federal government, they are in the states through federalism because they are sovereign and they can resist the federal government. My first memory of radio broadcasts of national conventions was hearing the sovereign state of such and such uh, casts its votes for so and so. But the states are not only not sovereign now, they never were sovereign. They never, in any stage of their development, had any of the basic rights of sovereignty, like that of making war, coining monies, raising armies, holding, uh, establishing post offices. The colonies, when they rebelled against the British Empire, instructed their representatives at the Continental Congress to make a joint refusal of British rule by the United States of America. And they set up a Congress that had all of the powers of sovereignty that none of the colonies, now become states, had at all. And the oath of allegiance, even then, was to the United States of America, not to the state of Connecticut or Maryland or whatever. Now, there is one problem with that assertion that I just made. The Articles of Confederation said at the outset that this will be a league of sovereign states. Now, how can I deny that when it's right there in plain words? Actually, rather easily, the man who wrote those words, Thomas Burke of North Carolina, and got them adopted into the Articles of Confederation, went home to North Carolina and said, don't ratify the Articles of Confederation. Although I said that we should be sovereign states under it, they have a whole number of provisions which prove that we're not sovereign states. Uh, so uh, that phrase, which he alone worked into the document, he himself said didn't apply to the document. Well, <clears throat> But couldn't the states raise their own armies in the sense that they had militias guaranteed them by the Articles of Confederation? That's not really true either. The Articles expressly forbade raising armies 
in the states, or navies, obviously, and expressly required the raising of militias for disposal by the Continental Congress as a national uh, body of uh, military people when that was required. The same thing is true of our Constitution. The militias guaranteed to the states by the Second Amendment are subordinate to the federal authority by Article I of the Constitution, which says Congress shall arm and set the training standards for state militias, which can be incorporated into the regular army whenever the president federalizes the militias, as happened as early as during the Whiskey Rebellion when President Washington federalized the militias to serve under the national authority. The idea that the state militias were envisaged as opposing the federal government is a result of one of those historical somersaults that plague all our popular myths about the Constitution. The arguments that are now used to interpret the Second Amendment as a formula for resistance to the federal government uh, were raised not at the time when the passage of the Second Amendment occurred, but earlier when the debate over ratifying the Constitution was underway. The anti-federalists then said we must stick with our state militias in order to prevent the ratifying of a Constitution that would justify a standing army. Well, they lost that argument. The Constitution was ratified, and Article I does justify the Congress's raising uh, an army uh, even in peacetime, therefore a standing army. So by the time the Constitution was ratified, all those arguments that were made in favor of the militias to preclude, to prevent, to substitute for the standing army were now obsolete. So much so that when the Second Amendment was put up for ratification, the anti-federalists who first formulated these arguments in favor of the militias refused to support ratification of the Second Amendment. And here's what's really crazy. The arguments they used against ratifying the Second Amendment are now regularly used by people explaining what the Second Amendment means. Totally topsy-turvy. How did we get to a situation in which our constitutional history is read uh, it, through the looking glass? Well, that's the result of many forces, including national character and historical accident, the need to reconcile two things deep in our system of values. On the one hand, we honor the Constitution. We honor the founders almost to the point of idolatry. On the other hand, we honor the values of those who are opposed to government on many grounds, religion, regional grounds, individualism, our frontier tradition, our Puritan heritage in which the autonomy of the saved soul was so important. We honor them too. How are we going to have our cake and eat it too? Well, by saying that the government is itself anti-governmental and therefore we can accept it. We can get them both. We have this wonderful constitution, but it's wonderful because it checks itself and balances itself and has co-equal parts and is inefficient and has sovereign states always stopping its uh, runaway tendencies. None of that's true, but it's very comforting. Uh, the trouble with it, of course, is that if we have this tremendous fear and distrust of government and think that it's justified by the constitution itself, we can't turn to the government for many needs. By that, I don't mean we can't turn to it in periods of great crisis like war. Unfortunately, in war, we set aside all our misgivings about authority and tend to become super patriotic and let the government do anything. I'm talking now about other crises. When the poor or the needy require assistance, uh, when we have educational problems that could best be addressed at the, at the federal level. For instance, unlike most advanced nations, we do not have a national curriculum or a school leaving exam that provides a standard and an impetus to meet the educational requirements of all our citizens. What is the result? Nicholas Lemon has just written a book showing the near tyranny of one procedure, the SAT exam, set up by a private enterprise in Princeton. It has many flaws and drawbacks and some strengths, but we've been forced to accept it because a public program at the national level debated in the open 
on which we could vote through our representatives would be regarded as the encroachment of that horrible thing, government. So instead, we have a procedure that we cannot challenge. We cannot change the administration of the tests by a democratic process. We cannot use the instruments of government here because government itself is called unrepresentative and undemocratic. It would be far more representative and far more democratic than the SAT system. That's the odd world we live in. <clears throat> now, admittedly, we all do have to keep strict controls on anything as powerful as a government, keep it accountable, make it uh, fess up when it spends our money. But that's true with any agents we hire. That's essentially what a representative in the government is, our agent. We commission the person to go off and do something for us and reward them with our vote. In the same way, when we hire any agent, a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or a mechanic, we hire them for their expertise, their training, their experience. We don't want amateurs. Uh, we want them to do their job. On the other hand, we want them to give us a strict accounting of what they're doing and why we should be paying this amount of money for it. So unless we are willing to hire and rely on good agents in government, as in everything else, uh, we shall just keep on having these people who run against Washington, against the Beltway, against politicians. There are all these politicians running around there saying, vote for me because I hate politicians. I hate the government. I hate the Beltway. I hate Washington. Well, there are some hateful things in Washington. But if you look at the major domestic changes in this country in the last quarter of this century, you will find a truly breathtaking new emphasis on the dignity of individuals, one unparalleled in history, the dignity of women, half the human race, of blacks and other minorities, of Native Americans, of the gays, of the handicapped. And in all these cases, Governmental, governmental action, usually in the federal level, federal courts, helped along and protected this process of guaranteeing rights that we had said we were going to guarantee at the outset and are only now belatedly being guaranteed. This was part of the aim of setting up the federal government in the first place, as we can learn from John Jay's contribution to the Federalist. He said, that friction with Indians along the border states had led to white intransigence and anger that drew uh, the states into unjust wars. He said, if we have a federal government, it will be able to come in with cooler and more just procedures. Well, that was a prediction that came true, has come true many times, but quite spectacularly in our time. Uh, when I hear people talk of the government as an outsider coming in where it has no place. I catch echoes from the 50s and 60s when George Wallace and other Southern governors were saying that, when the federal government was trying to guarantee rights to American citizens who happened to have black skin. What was seen by the majority of whites down there as an alien power invading was seen by the people uh, who were being protected as rescuers, as defenders, as protectors for people who were being beaten and hosed and bitten and jailed and killed by that local government, which Ronald Reagan says always knows better than the federal government what its own people need. So for all of its shortcomings, there is a role to be played by government. It's that role, protecting the rights of people who would not be protected in any other way. And that's the government we should not entirely trust, but uphold and keep a watch on and be grateful for. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, I hope.
Certainly. Uh, did, it, did you hear the question back there? Uh, he said, isn't uh, distrust of government a selective thing, that when uh, liberals are in, conservatives distrust the government, when conservatives are in, liberals distrust the government? It all depends on whose ox is being gored. Sure, that's a fact of human life, and it's a fact of human life in all governments. What's interesting about America is that we have a, a different uh, grounding of that, which can be expressed by liberals or conservatives over the long term. One in which, as I point out, we have a principled view that government should be not only distrusted and not only the individuals who happen to be elected into this administration, but the government itself, and that the Constitution warrants this. Uh, it takes a, an amazing psychological pressure to, to change history the, the way we have, to read the Constitution in the way that we were taught to read it, as something that is commendably inefficient, uh, commendably checking itself, uh, commendably separated out into co-equal branches. That, that kind of uh, uh, psychological pressure to come up with historical absurdity is not a normal thing, even in other governments, and goes beyond whose ox is being gored election by election. Yes? Listening to what you say about the distrust of governments, I didn't know better. I would assume that the government is very small in this country, but in reality it's very big. It takes a large percentage of national income. How does that happen? Uh, good question. If we distrust government so much, how did it get to be so big? Uh, mainly by a few crises that made us uh, weaken our distrust to some extent. Uh, the Depression and the New Deal, and people still distrust, distrusted the government that was created then, but along came the war before it could be geared back. And most of our growth of big government has occurred through war. That's when the Civil War created a huge jump in the federal government. And World's, World War I and World War II both created big jumps, and the Cold War created big jumps. As I said, distrust gets suspended in wartime, and most of the growth of our government has been correlated with periods of war. By the way, uh, George Washington understood that, and that's why his neutrality policy, which was a brilliant and difficult thing to sustain, was put in because he said a republic's ethos should not be formed in time of war. You won't really have a sense of of what uh, uh, a republic should be. But the more government grew, the more people resented its doing anything except connected with war. If you say anything connected with war, space programs, et cetera, uh, people will say, OK, go ahead, government. Uh, that's why Eisenhower said, we have to have an interstate highway system for defense. Uh, so that we can move troops around fast and evacuate cities and all of that kind of thing. But then the resentment of government for th anything else uh, becomes all the greater. When we're spending so much money on defense, we get very, very stingy about spending it on welfare or on education or on other programs that could say, look at how big the government is. We can't have it uh, big. Uh, so we can't do these other things that uh, actually make more sense than a, a moonshot or something of that sort. Uh, and, the, and so you get President Reagan, who says government is not the uh, solution, it's the problem, at the same time when he's spending these vast, vast sums for uh, defense and building up all of these contracted companies, et cetera. So the growth of the big government, you know, even, the, even though we consider our government big, we are the least taxed of any of the major industrialized democracies, the least taxed uh, nation. Uh, and we are the richest. We should be the one who could afford to be more taxed than Germany or England or France. But we're not. We're undertaxed. And the, that uh, feeling that everything that goes to the government is a kind of theft from us is very strong among people. Uh, that's why cutting taxes, even when it makes no economic sense, is always a hot item in the electoral process. Yes. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah. You stated it. I don't know what to add to it. You stated it too perfectly. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. The original idea of the Constitution was that the interests would play out through the elected representatives. And we like to think that that's the case. But now, because of the influence of lobbies and money and that kind of thing, uh, they play on, in an outside the electoral process or a corrupting of the electoral process. That is, uh, it's not what votes you give, but what money you give, which can influence a candidate. And, and yet, what happens when you try to control that money, the thing that checks it is precisely anti-governmentalism. When you say we should have campaign finance laws, what you hear from the people who are in favor of the money system is that, oh, no, no, that's against the First Amendment. That would allow the government to take away your freedom. So. Even that extra governmental corrupting influence is protected by anti governmentalism. Yes? Coming back to the question a little earlier, which you gave a response to the fact of a rational effect. War and oppression, government expands, but then it doesn't recede or recede very much once the war is over. Why is that? Why don't we go back to where we were before? <coughs> Well, once the, uh, the government takes on new functions, it's very hard to uh, defund them. Uh, for one thing, in the Civil War case, the government was really not doing what, all that it should have. The Jacksonian era, when Tocqueville visited America, had a gov federal government that was far too weak and state governments that were far too strong. That's when Tocqueville said that the majority tyranny at the state level is so great that it imposes a kind of orthodoxy on everybody. And he said that, that uh, Jackson, in trying to cut down the size of the federal government, was encouraging all of that. So at that stage, war was an excuse for the federal government to take on some functions that it should have taken on. Uh, in the case of World War I and World War II and the Cold War, the government also had to grow uh, as our technological complicated society grows. There are more things that the government has to be a watchdog or an arbiter or an umpire uh, in. Uh, so that there was always an excuse to keep all of the new functions and make them grow. Uh, some of that was justified. I don't think all of it was. Uh, but in the case of our situation now, we haven't really had a chance to shrink it back because we had the Cold War right up until yesterday. And the Cold War was something that, uh, that really encouraged a tremendous amount of governmental activity. Uh, you know, everything was justified in terms of the government. Uh, I went down to the Canal Zone to write a story about drug laws down there at the time when we still owned the Canal Zone. And I was shocked to see in, on the TV a news commentator come on and wear a uniform. And I said to the PR guy down there uh, for the base, uh, I thought I was in a fascist country you know, here. And the news, independent newsman's wearing a uniform. He said, oh, God, I've been trying to get rid of that for years and years and years. And I, I can't do it because every time a congressman comes down here, we have to tell him, we're vital to the national defense. If you take away the canal zone, if you take away the Panama Canal, we're going to be weakened and fall to our enemies. So we have to be super military. Everything has to be military. Uh, everything was justified in terms of national defense. When I first started teaching, 
back uh, in 1961, the Sputnik scare had made people think, oh my God, Ivan can read and Johnny can't. We've got to boost our education process for uh, defense, national defense purposes. The American Philological Association, I was teaching Greek at the time, the American Philosophical, uh, uh, Philological Association sent out letters to its members saying, please think up a reason and mail it to your congressman why teaching Greek will help us to win the Cold War. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> So once that had gone on for so long, you know, for practically half a century, the Cold War has lasted, did last, uh, we haven't really had a chance yet to, to uh, shrink back. I don't know if we will. I hope we will somewhat at least. Uh, but, you know, the CIA is inventing new threats. Daniel Patrick Moynihan published a wonderful book on secrecy in which he said, the Cold War is over. You would think that the number of secret documents would shrink. He said, no, it's grown. The rate of growth has increased since the end of the Cold War. We have more secrets being produced now than we had during the Cold War. Uh, it's a runaway process that's very, very hard to stop. Yes, over here. Did you hear that question? Uh, how, how come conservatives who are against government intrusion into business and politics and other things, uh, on the other hand, do want an intrusion into private life when it's a matter of abortion and uh, moral issues like, uh, I suppose, censorship and divorce and things of that sort? Uh, well, only a certain number of conservatives are of that strain. There are a lot. Conservatism has a, many strands, you know, the libertarians and the economic people, and, and it's the, uh, the moral, uh, largely Christian right elements of the conservatives who, are, who take that position. And a lot of them are not really very interested in uh, the conservative positions on the economy or politics. Uh, they became interested in it because it was an, an electoral way for them to have a hearing. But for a long time, those people had withdrawn from politics because they were not really activist conservatives of the Republican sort. Uh, so a lot of that contradiction is something that has grown up kind of accidentally in order to get a lies among the other Republicans or right-wingers or conservatives. They've had to get interested in, the, in other issues. That was what Ralph Reed was very positive in saying we've got to do. We've got to get these people who are just interested in prayer and the home and fidelity and all that interested in tax cuts, because that's where the votes are. And you'll notice that when uh, Newt Gingrich put up his contract for America, he expressly excluded all the moral issues, all the social issues, and he had Ralph Reed come along and say to people, it was all done in conjunction, well, you know, we have to do this for them, and then once we get them in, they'll do, that, they'll do good things for us. So it's a, it's a forced alliance. It's a marriage of convenience. And the strains are always showing, and they're, they're, uh, they make it difficult for some candidates to hold these groups together. George Bush, I presume, is feeling that problem right now. How do you hold together the moral majority and the libertarians and the uh, economic laissez-faire free traders and uh, uh, free marketers, et cetera?
No, actually, at the time of the ratification of the Tenth Amendment, it was not so much state sovereignty, because remember what the Tenth Amendment says is all powers not delegated to the federal government are retained by the states. It doesn't say sovereignty, by the way. Qu quite different thing. Powers are not sovereignty. Uh, and what the Tenth Amendment is, is a statement of the obvious. If they're not delegated, they're not delegated. <laughs> and that's the way it has been read through most of our history. The whole uh, history of the Tenth Amendment, as far as the courts is concerned, is a very brief one because it's been treated as tautological. Of course, if they're not delegated, they're not delegated. But what now, we have Clarence Thomas and Antonin Scalia trying to say that sovereignty is the issue in the Tenth Amendment. There's no justification for saying that. And they also are trying to say that there is such a thing as partial sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty is the French form of supremus in Latin, the highest. Now, you can't have a highest if something's higher than the highest, or as high as the highest, then it's not the highest. Uh, as Lincoln said in fighting the idea that the southern states were sovereign and could withdraw from the Union, uh, he said that a sovereignty is a thing about which you can say there's nothing above it. Uh, now, even the people who, are, who believe in partial or residual sovereignty in the states admit that there's something above it, the federal government. And Madison uh, and Hamilton both said that it is uh, an anomaly, it is a solecism to say that there can be sovereignty within sovereignty, imperium in imperio. So the, the whole idea that there is a, there's a kind of sovereignty that you can fall back on is, is nonsense. There are, there are state powers, there should be. Jefferson, uh, Madison said that. Uh, but that doesn't mean sovereignty. If you go to a country and you say, I'm going to take away your ability to make war, to make peace, to uh, coin money, to have post offices, to uh, do all of those things, but I'm not going to ex take away your sovereignty. They would tell you, forget it. <laughs> you know? That's nonsense. Uh, you can't not be able to do those things and be a sovereign. Yes, sir. Well, I don't know if the, the voting problem is always with us. Uh, is there hope? The great problem, of course, is the Buckley decision, the decision that said that giving money is an expression of uh, opinion under the First Amendment. Uh, I think that's nonsense, but until it gets repealed, it's going to be very difficult to have uh, serious uh, campaign finance reform. You know, other countries do limit extremely uh, the kinds of campaigns that can be conducted. Uh, I covered a campaign in Japan, and in Japan, you cannot appear on television during a campaign. You have to go around to the people and actually talk to them. Uh, now, that's a, you would think that's a very inefficient system, but it's fascinating. I, I followed this candidate, and what they do, they go to a town, and they've announced ahead of time where the debates will be, where the where the candidates will be. And they, since there are, it's a multi-party system, there may be 10 candidates in each locale. And at sector A, they'll start uh, the candidates, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Each one will have 12 minutes. They'll give their talk there. Then they'll go to sector B. And as, they, as each one finishes here, he goes over here, and then he goes over here, and then he goes over here. Uh, and so they actually hear all these people in their home arena, and they get to ask some questions afterward, not during the actual performance. But uh, it's so interesting to me that, uh, that you could hear a pin drop, the, the attention that was paid to these candidates. I had an interpreter with me, and he was whispering, and he had to stop because people were so upset that they couldn't hear. Uh, and, and the candidates are very serious in their talks. Uh, I thought, the first time I, I saw this, no American candidate could go 12 minutes 
without getting an applause line or a laugh line or something like that. It's, it's serious. He, he speaks for 12 minutes. There's no interruption. There's no break. He doesn't tell jokes. He doesn't ingratiate himself. There's no showbiz. Uh, well, you know, that's only one way of limiting, but it's, uh, it shows what can be done. We don't have huge long campaigns in, in other countries. Uh, of course, they don't know when their elections are going to be often. It's when Parliament, uh, when the Prime Minister fails to get a vote of confidence, and then they have to have a quick campaign. Uh, but of course, nonetheless, that's a, a campaign with very severe time limits. Uh, and so that you, it's not going to take away our freedom if we limit the way people campaign in this country. But anti-governmentalism uh, says, oh, of course, if the government does it, it is oppressive. It does take away freedom. Uh, there was a, yeah. What is the rhetoric of the Gettysburg Address for the Truth Pieces of Ally? What is the rhetoric of it? Where is the rhetoric of the Gettysburg Address that the Truth Pieces of Ally Well, <clears throat> the rhetoric of the Gettysburg Address is that uh, it was time for the federal government to vindicate the hope that you could have a free government where uh, a government could be of the people, by the people, and for the people. Uh, he thought that the tearing apart of the Union was tearing apart the ability of a government to reflect the popular will. Uh, so he was for the government. He was against sovereign states. Uh, he was against the idea that they had ever been sovereign. Uh, so that was a, a pro-governmental speech. It was like the attitude of the original framers uh, and against the, the attitude of Thomas Jefferson's, Jefferson and others who didn't like too much what the original framers were up to. Remember, he was not around when the Constitution was drawn up and he always had many misgivings about it. Uh, he was over in France. He thought, for instance, that uh, it should return to the Articles in many ways, that it should return to uh, term limits, for instance. He said the perpetual re-eligibility of the president for office is enough to show that the, that the uh, Constitution will decline into uh, despotism. He said the president should have only one term, and then he became terms. Yeah, that's a very good question. The question is, are we trying to get a new Cold War with China? The search for an enemy uh, is something that's now part of our national psyche, I think. Uh, we seem only to pull together when we've got some outside enemy. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, said that if only we were invaded by Mars, then we and Russia would get together. <laughs> We'd have our own outside enemy. Uh, and, and it's true that we get energized when we have an enemy, Fidel or Saddam, any of these uh, enemies. And China is our big enemy now. Uh, in, in a way, Japan was not our enemy precisely, but a threat. Twenty years ago, Japan was going to take over the economy. And we were all running scared of that. We we're going to have to do all these things. Now China is going to be the great economic threat. And not only economic threat, but nuclear and ideological threat. Well, it is. It's, it's some kind of threat. But uh, it's not something that should be resp uh, responded to with hysteria, as some people are tending to do. Yeah, that, that need for an enemy. And of course, as I say, the CIA uh, and the military, the Pentagon, are all looking around for enemies so that they can justify their budgets and their upkeep. Uh, they say, you, you, you've got to be able to fight two and a half wars, you know, <laughs> not one war, two and a half wars. Uh, just conceivably, somebody might do something in two different places and we want to respond. Uh, that's all kind of, uh, during the nuclear era, the worst case scenario came along. We've got to imagine that the worst thing they can do is what they're going to do and therefore we have to respond in kind. And so we had totally hysterical responses to the so-called missile gap uh, and other gaps. Uh, 
there never was a missile gap. There was never even in a close approximation to a missile gap. But we were all uh, told by President Kennedy, by candidate Kennedy when he campaigned, among others, uh, that the Russians are way ahead of us and that they're supermen. That's why we were all so surprised when it collapsed, you know. <laughs> We'd been taught that these are people who are really quite extraordinary and uh, there's probably no way we could bring them down. That whole thing always was fascinating to me that on the one hand we said the free market is really efficient and you can't beat it. On the other hand, the Russians are beating us and they don't have it. Didn't make sense. Yes? Yeah, did you hear that question? That there's a great uh, American tradition of creating nonprofit uh, agencies to take care of problems that surprise people in Europe, which don't have that. Uh, that's true, and that's a very valuable part of our tradition. Uh, on the other hand, it's used sometimes by the anti-governmental people to say, oh well, Leave it to the churches, leave it to the uh, nonprofits. They can handle it all. The government has, doesn't have to come in and do it. Uh, when uh, any real need arises, those nonprofits get swamped in, in things like uh, uh, disasters, hurricanes, and floods, and all of that kind of thing. The nonprofits can do a certain amount, but the government is always necessary, among other things, to supply transport and to coordinate and, and do that kinds of, those kinds of things. So that in large part, the government does more in Europe because there's a tradition of it doing more. For instance, support of the arts. Uh, ruling families had always supported the arts. So when governments came along and replaced the ruling families, they kept up much of that. Opera is supported in France and in Italy and in England in ways that it's, by the government, in ways that, it does, that it's not here. But there's an awful lot that, uh, that private organizations can't do and the government has to do, uh, not only in the area of physical need for people, but in the cultural needs of the country. For instance, one of the things that happened when Reagan came in is that he cut back severely on the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, long before the fights that have been more recent. And that s closed off the money that was going into the publication of the Founders' Papers, just at a time when computers had come along and made a, a big leap forward possible. And they had to drop staff that were familiar with these projects, that had uh, learned how to do things fast and efficiently. Uh, and when they tried to pick that up with private money, there just wasn't enough even though some, some tried, various foundations. And actually, the private money had been there at the outset, and that had failed. Uh, the New York Times had started the publication of Jefferson's papers, and that became a huge project, very expensive, and they couldn't keep it up. Uh, and so uh, a lot of that money came from the National Endowment for the Humanities. But the ideal thing, of course, is to have both, to have a, a flourishing uh, nonprofit kind of church and other charities, and to have a government that is able to respond to need efficiently and fast when, it's, when uh, there's a need for it. Yes, sir. The question was, in, in view of the smaller and smaller numbers of people voting, where will this take us? That's a very complicated issue. 80% uh, of the people voted in the late 19th century, but the majority of the people couldn't vote. Women couldn't vote. 
Uh, they're a little bit more than half. Uh, Transins couldn't. Most, lots of blacks couldn't. Lots of what we've had in this century is an immense extension of the vote in terms of numbers and of percentage of the population. Uh, but because we compare it to the percentage of the population that was, were, were qualified voters in the olden days, it seems like there's a big falling off. Now, I don't say that to justify non-voting. I think that uh, uh, there's been an effort by a lot of people to prevent people from voting. You know, the tremendous uh, opposition to ease of registration, uh, to being able to register on site uh, when, you, when you go to vote, or to become a registered voter when you get your driver's license and all that kind of thing. Uh, all of those things are tremendously fought, largely uh, by partisan considerations in territories where uh, they realize that if you <coughs> have more blacks voting, they'll vote Democratic. Uh, if you have more pe poor people voting, they'll vote Democratic. But uh, one of the reasons why, there are, there are so many reasons. One of the reasons is that we don't have a parliamentary system, that we have a, a two-party system. A two-party system is of its nature a compromise system. Each party tries to get a centrist within its spread, and then it tries to move over into the center to get the, the uh, electorate there. And in the process, a lot of people who feel desperately uh, urgent about uh, issue A or B and find this kind of compromise going on kind of lose interest. Whereas in a parliamentary system, even if you're going to get only 3% of the parliament, uh, if you vote for your candidate, that 3% becomes a bargaining chip with the others. And you often can't form a majority unless you need that 3%. Uh, and so there's a great incentive for people to turn out and vote in those multi-party parliamentary systems that we don't have here. So I, I don't think that it's uh, totally apathy or lack of citizen virtue uh, on the other hand, I think everyone should vote and should be encouraged to vote. But it's, as I say, it's, you have to take a comparative view of, uh, of other people. I don't think that the higher voting record in many other countries shows a real uh, higher degree of citizen virtue or participation. Yes? Yeah, she said the effect of the press can often depress votes because people say oh, X or Y can't win anyway, or uh, they report findings, I presume you mean, before they are uh, totally tall tallied and all that kind of thing. Well, the press has many sins to <laughs> uh, answer for, and I suppose that's one of them. Uh, on the other hand, guessing who's going to win and who's not is something that's always going on and always will go on and that, that can discourage people from voting even if you talk to nobody but your neighbors. In fact, often it'll be worse with your neighbors because in the press at least you hear from various sectors. If all you talk to is the people in one area and they all happen to be for uh, one candidate, then you'll think no other candidate is even worth considering. The press at least makes you consider some or can allow you to consider some and the press is really very uh, variegated now. It is online. You can find anything online, you know. Uh, and so the, the idea that uh, the press kind of dictates what we will, what candidate we will accept, uh, I, don't, I don't think it works that way for a good reason. Well, I worked for Esquire magazine back in the 60s and 70s, and they set out a couple of times to create a candidate. Uh, uh, not only they, but some other people in, in connection with them, and, and they couldn't. 
<laughs> they found it's very hard to get people interested in someone who's not really very interesting except because some sector of the press says that you should be interested in them. Uh, it's not as easy as it sounds to, for the press to dictate our views. It works the other way around mainly. It has to run and cater to us because it has to uh, make money. Yes, way back. <coughs> Well, yes, the courts have extended the power of government in lots of ways. As you say, on national security, they just say, oh, that's political, we aren't going to get involved in that. That's very unfortunate in some cases. You know, that's what they said when the Japanese Americans were sent off to camps during World War II. Uh, they said, oh, well, that's, that's a national security issue, so we can't cope with that. Uh, now, the use of the Commerce Clause, you can argue about the, the, uh, the constitutionality of various devices, but what was being done there was an attempt to bring the federal government into the protection of minorities. And I think that uh, by and large, there might be better rationales for it, that's been a, a healthy thing. Uh, it's not expanded the size of government in any other way than uh, saying that certain rights are now within our purview that weren't before. And I think they always should have been within the purview, and probably they should be argued in a better way. But I don't think that that extends the, the uh, size of government. It certainly extends the reach of certain parts of government. Uh, anyway, I think we have only time for about two more questions. Yes. You, you've explained the expression of our distrust, but what would your explanation for the, the, uh, the root cause of it? Simply uh, land of immigrants, water revolution, and never got over it? <coughs> What's the root cause for uh, the distrust that's made us distort our constitutional history and that kind of thing? Very good question. I don't think there is any one. It is in the American character. As I, I mentioned some of the things. America, when we started out, had uh, no center, uh, unlike other nations. For, one of the main things is we decided not to have an established religion. That's an amazing, amazing thing. That was the most original thing we did. It had never really been done before, to have a nation that didn't have an established religion. Now, once you get an established religion, there is a kind of sanctification of the government and uh, a, a unification of the people because you're all believers. Uh, since we didn't have that, we didn't have a capital at the beginning, we didn't have shared history of the colonies, uh, we didn't have a, a common cultural heritage, uh, there was a tremendous distrust of the idea of a single template being placed down upon the nation. And then, as I say, myths of the frontier, of individualism, the idea that we are all citizens who just go off and make our own world, uh, protect ourselves, uh, all of those fed into it. And once you get this kind of thing happening, various strands come in. It's hard to define the character of a people, and, you, and it's dangerous to say, oh, the Americans are just X. 
They're, they're really a lot of things. Uh, but they do pull in certain directions, and that's all I'm trying to describe, that many of these tendencies pull in the direction of anti-governmentalism. Uh, and I'm afraid that's all I can say about it. There is, to, to give the psychological, cultural roots of any long-standing, deep-seated thing, it's like saying, where did American racism come from? It came from a lot of places, but it all got put together in a very strong way, alas. Yes? Sure. Well, I say in general you should mistrust government. I just say you shouldn't be pathological about it. Uh, the, uh, you bring up the, the Giuliani case. Uh, our whole attitude toward the arts is one that comes out of what I mentioned earlier, the lack of uh, organized religion, of an established religion. That was really the source of most patronage of the arts in the past. And in Europe, the patronage of the arts descends pretty clearly from that to this day. In America, since we don't have an established religion, we didn't have uh, people doing art like the Acropolis for the gods in Athens or for the Pope in Renaissance Italy, etc. The question was, should the government support the arts at all? And I think that it should for a very interesting reason. In the Constitution, in Article One, when it's giving powers to Congress, it says it has the power to coin money, to establish post offices, to make war, etc. Two, 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 and then it comes to something in which it doesn't put the power grant in an infinitive two. It says, in order to, it says to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Uh, the government has power to do that by guaranteeing to inventors the uh, right to their property for a certain amount of time. Now that says there, that's the only preamble to any of these. It's a kind of mini preamble within the Constitution, a broad grant like the opening grants to form a more perfect union, to promote the general welfare and do all that. And to promote science and the useful arts, the patent copyright clause is not about private property. It's not about the property of the artist. It's about the good of the community. You, you promote the progress for all of our good. Now, science and the useful arts, useful arts in the 18th century meant the fine arts because they were considered to be morally refining. Uh, and that's why even people who were chary about government power, like Thomas Jefferson, were for promoting a national university and for national uplifting uh, things of that sort. And Congress, of course, instantly decided that useful arts covered music, dance, the literature, theater, and all that. So the government has a role here, but it's a role that can't be prescriptive about an established set of values. Uh, the government, the Congress has to be accountable for the money it gives out. It can't give it out irresponsibly. But in terms of promoting the arts, that means having qualified people ask qualified people what they think is useful art at the time, 
uh, which means peer review, which can be abused, but is essentially the right path to take. We get doctors who qualify doctors, we get lawyers who qualify doctors, we should get artists who qualify artists. And how you split up the monies for that uh, will always be a matter of concern. But the idea that the government should, just because it gives the money, come in and say, but this kind of art you can't have, this kind of art you must have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera is, uh, is t entirely wrong and out of the uh, spirit of the Constitution, it seems to me. So much for you, Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.